On this Thursday night, anxiety mounts over the spread of COVID-19. From a major market meltdown to new travel bans. This virus is not influenza. One country takes swift action. But the risk of a global pandemic is very much upon us. And the U.S. reports a new mysterious case. High stakes talks between Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and government ministers. Plus, why no one's enforcing a court order to break up this barricade. And saving the North Atlantic right whales. We are confident that these measures will be effective. Ottawa's plan to protect and preserve an endangered species. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Even if you aren't sick with the virus and don't know anyone who is, COVID-19 is beginning to disrupt lives around the world, well beyond the epicenter in China. From flight cancellations and travel restrictions to warnings of serious economic implications, millions of people are feeling the effects of what's become an international health crisis. There are now confirmed cases in at least 50 countries. In France, where there are 38 known cases, the president told doctors today an epidemic is coming and to prepare for it. The biggest outbreaks outside Asia are still in Italy and Iran, but almost every hour another country confirms new cases. The potential impact has spooked investors so much the investment bank Goldman Sachs forecasts American companies will see zero earnings growth in 2020. In New York, the Dow Jones plummeted almost 1,200 points. That's the biggest one-day point decline in history. In Toronto, there were huge sell-offs, too. On the TSX, it dropped more than 300 points before trading was abruptly halted for the day. The exchange blamed technical issues. Here's what's also fueling fears. Thousands of people in California are being monitored for signs of COVID-19. They may have come into contact with a woman who tested positive there, and she was sick for a week before she was tested. How she got the virus is a mystery. Officially, there are 60 confirmed cases in the U.S., but it's clear now not everyone who should be tested is being tested. Jackson Prosco on the trouble that is causing. In Northern California, a new COVID-19 mystery. A woman with no history of travel and no contact with known patients has tested positive for the virus. She's in hospital and on a ventilator. The person who exposed them probably exposed others, so there's probably other cases out there in the community that we don't know about. It may be the first case of community transmission in the U.S., exposing a huge gap in the American response. Despite being in hospital and having all the symptoms, the woman wasn't originally tested for COVID-19 because she didn't meet strict U.S. government criteria, the exact scenario experts have warned about. I'm very concerned about the level of testing, and I'm puzzled about the level of testing. If a country like South Korea can do tens of thousands of tests, I do not understand why in our country we have managed to do barely 500. More than 8,000 people in California are now being monitored for symptoms as the U.S. scrambles to ramp up its testing ability. But in Washington, the response to the virus has been defiant. I don't think it's inevitable. On Wednesday, the president contradicted his own experts and proclaimed the U.S. would soon have almost no cases of the virus. We're going to be pretty soon at only five people, and we could be at just one or two people over the next short period of time. Wall Street isn't buying it. The Dow took another steep dive, continuing its rapid decline into correction territory. While the White House reportedly considered enacting special wartime measures to increase production of masks and protective equipment for medical workers, officials have warned supplies are woefully inadequate. There's also a heavy focus on managing public perception. U.S. government scientists and officials have been told they can't speak publicly or to the press until they coordinate with the office of the vice president, the man overseeing Trump's coronavirus response. Donna? All right, Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. Right now, the most deaths outside China are in Iran. A major religious gathering there has been canceled. Friday prayers have been called off in Tehran and several other cities as well to try to limit the spread. After a dramatic jump in confirmed cases, the official number in Iran is 245 and 26 deaths. And it's spreading through senior Iranian officials after Iran's deputy health minister, who kept working while visibly sick and then tested positive, at least five others are now ill, including a female vice president and a prominent cleric who has died. 
Crystal Gamansing has details on the global spread of this virus. The crowds have vanished. The novel coronavirus is scaring away customers from the cafes and shops of Italy. Venice is on its knees, says this business owner. We don't know how to react. More than 600 people in Italy are infected, and COVID-19 has caused three more deaths in the Lombardy region. The governor there is infected and is updating people on his condition by posting videos online. The epidemics in the Islamic Republic of Iran, Italy, and the Republic of Korea demonstrate what this virus is capable of. But this virus is not influenza. With the right measures, it can be contained. But it's not being contained. South Korea, with the largest one-day infection spike since January 20th, set up drive through screening centers. Nearly 9,000 kilometers away, another mobile site, this one in London, where again more cases have been detected. Australia's Prime Minister outlined his country's plan to protect public health, and he didn't shy away from the seriousness of the virus. WHO is yet to declare uh, the nature of the uh, coronavirus and its move towards a pandemic phase. Um, we believe that the risk of a global pandemic is very much upon us. Mitigating risks is a key, and for the first time, Saudi Arabia is banning all foreign pilgrims. <laughs> Officials say we feel a sense of responsibility, therefore we took these temporary decisions which will constantly be reviewed. A full ban wasn't even implemented for the Ebola outbreak in 2014. Throughout the year, millions of Muslims head to the kingdom for pilgrimages, and there's no time frame for when this ban might be lifted. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Here in Canada, there are still no deaths linked to COVID-19. The number of confirmed cases, though, grew today to 13. A man in Toronto has tested positive. Public health officials believe the man in his 60s contracted the virus from his wife. She tested positive after returning from Iran. The couple is now at home in self-isolation. Federal officials say the risk of contracting the virus here in Canada remains low. As for traveling to other countries where the risk is higher, there are some things you should know. We've got some helpful tips on our website, globalnews.ca slash globalnational. There's no indication this is related, but Pope Francis skipped a mass planned for today because he's feeling unwell. Yesterday during Ash Wednesday mass, the 83-year-old was coughing and blowing his nose. He shook hands and kissed babies in St. Peter's Square. And in his message to the crowd, the Pope offered his sympathy to victims of the coronavirus. The Vatican said today he's slightly unwell and preferred to work from home. Now to the rail blockades in Canada. A federal minister is in northern B.C. meeting those with Sowetan hereditary chiefs who don't want a natural gas pipeline crossing their territory. And the RCMP have agreed to suspend their patrols along a service road there. A resolution could lead to an end to the rail blockades elsewhere in the country. Sarah McDonald is in Smithers, B.C., where those talks are taking place. The eyes of the nation were on this tarmac in northern BC Thursday. And one high profile passenger in particular. We're um, looking forward to the meeting. Carolyn Bennett, representing the federal government in high stakes talks with Indigenous leaders, ready to come to the table. What was that misunderstanding? I was in the air. <laughs> So uh, we, I was on my way here. We always wanted to meet. But not providing details on why talks setting the stage for a nation-to-nation -nation meeting were abruptly called off on Wednesday. Yeah. Were the Wet'suwet'en and hereditary chiefs asked to call for an end to the blockades across Canada? No, I, I think the... I think the issue is that uh, I think everybody believes that there needed to be some space. With the RCMP now pulling its members off this polarized parcel of Indigenous land and work briefly halted on the natural gas pipeline sparking unrest nationwide. The traditional leaders of what's so a nation fiercely opposed to the $6.6 .6 billion project that's backed by band councils and all levels of government say they're open to dialogue. We did not want it to get to this point of disruption. But that was actually the federal and provincial government. But the chiefs won't call for an end to blockades like these, crippling rail traffic and parts of the Canadian economy for weeks. 
drawing the ire and condemnation of many Wet'suwet'en people like Marion Tiljo Shepherd. I am for the pipeline. I am for industry. Banking on the benefits and prosperity promised by that pipeline. People just want to work. Our community wants to work. And I think the benefits are going to be really important to our people. With livelihoods on the line, exactly how it will proceed and with what level of support, if any, from those determined to stop it, all depends on what happens behind these closed doors. And if a resolution will be reached remains a major question mark at this point. Donna, both sides are calling this an important first step in what will likely be a lengthy process. All right, Sarah McDonald in Smithers, B.C., thanks. In Tyendinaga, Ontario, protesters were back at it today, trying to set a fire along the tracks. Yesterday, a fire caused a freight train to stop. Some people taunted a train standing on the tracks trying to block it. There were no arrests, but questions are being raised about who should be held accountable for reckless and potentially dangerous acts. Our Mike Drolet is there tonight. Mike? Donna, tensions have been high here in Tyendinaga with Mohawk protesters on one side of the tracks, OPP on the other. But this weather seems to have cooled things down a bit today. The extreme winds and cold have, for the most part, kept both sides seeking shelter. It was a quiet Thursday morning in Tyendinaga. The trains ran smoothly and unimpeded as extreme winds and cold kept protesters in their tents. But mid-afternoon, the Mohawk anger flared up. Protesters threw wood on the tracks, which the Ontario Provincial Police promptly removed. Protesters then attempted to light a fire next to a passing train, but the winds blew it out. And so it continues. A back and forth that Federal Transport Minister Mark Garneau says has resulted in a logjam of 184 trains sitting idle. The confrontation seemed inevitable Wednesday as Mohawks played chicken with passing trains while lighting fires with wood pallets and further away, an SUV. No arrests were made, leading many to question why. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called it reckless, yet stopped short of saying the Ontario Provincial Police officers dedicated to the territory should make arrests. For its part, the government is unequivocal that it wasn't terrorism. The kinds of reckless things that were done yesterday uh, are dangerous, uh, particularly uh, if dangerous goods, and trains carry a lot of dangerous goods, uh, are involved. An interview with one of the protesters arrested on Monday was posted on social media. Nick Kolbasuk spoke of the OPP's heavy-handed approach. And they said, put your arm behind your back. I said, I can't, you're standing on it. He said he was hoping to avoid conflict, adding he believes most Canadians don't understand the issues at hand. Our laws, our traditions, were here before Canadian laws and Canadian government. Most of us are fine as long as they can learn to live in harmony with us, live in peace with us, and respect our laws and our traditions. Now, the Mohawks haven't been speaking to the media, but all day they've been loading up on supplies, seemingly preparing to stay here for the long haul. Donna? Okay, Mike Drolet, thanks. Quebec's Premier Francois Legault is refusing to apologize for suggesting some in Ganawake are armed with assault rifles. There is growing solidarity in the Mohawk territory south of Montreal, where demonstrators have been blocking rail traffic for nearly three weeks. That's where our Mike Armstrong is tonight. Just around the corner, up the hill from this checkpoint, Mohawks have blocked a set of tracks. Normally there'd be both commuter and freight trains running through. They're not. It's been 18 days and counting for this blockade, and no one's leaving. Oh, tremendous solidarity. Tremendous. And, and every time uh, uh, somebody tries to escalate it, it gets better. Now, that talk of escalation is a reference to something Quebec's premier said Wednesday, explaining why police weren't acting to remove the blockade. Francois Legault said it was because there are dangerous weapons on the Ganawage Reserve, things like, he said, AK-47s. He tried to paint us as, as being violent and armed, and we're not. You, you've been here, some of you have been here a long time. You haven't seen any, any weapons or anything like that. You know, they're not here. The Premier isn't retracting or apologizing. His office says the situation is delicate, but that he was telling the truth and trying to inform Quebecers. Well, it is clear no external police force is going onto the reserve to take down the barricade. In fact, there is a court injunction ordering the blockade be lifted, but no one's delivering the document. That would be stupid. Saying, first of all, that we fear that there could be a confrontation, an armed confrontation, and now we will ask someone to show up with paper. That would be stupid. 
Now, the reserve is policed by an indigenous force. In fact, the Ganawage peacekeepers say they're the only indigenous force in Canada staffed exclusively by indigenous officers. It would fall to them to enforce the court order. They've decided they will not. We live here, we work here, we have family here. Uh, this is our home and we believe in supporting our people and we're going to continue to do that. The protesters are following the situation in BC and if there's progress, they're ready to lift the blockade, but not, they say, before progress. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Nanawage, Quebec. A severe storm hits Quebec coming up, the terrifying winter wipeout for one truck driver. In Edmonton, as the government was tabling its budget today, teachers, nurses, doctors and other public sector workers marched to the legislature, angry about cuts to public services that Premier Jason Kenney's government has already made and fearing more are coming. Kenney has promised to balance the books, and this was the second budget in four months. Alberta is suffering through a prolonged downturn in the oil and gas sector. The province is still facing an almost $7 billion deficit. But as Heather Urich's West reports, Alberta's finance minister is counting on an upswing in fortunes to bring in more revenue. Alberta's budget 2020 is being called a plan for jobs and the economy, but at its heart, its focus is on oil and gas. 2019 was a tough year, but there are signs of life. One pipeline, Line 3, began to come online in December, though it will take one more, either Trans Mountain or Keystone, to get Alberta the market access it needs. Betting that will happen, the province is forecasting oil revenues will double by 2023. Well, hindsight's going to be 2020, but, but as I look ahead, and again, when I evaluate every one of those revenue lines and take a look at our underlying assumptions that have informed our revenue projections, I don't believe we're being over-optimistic. To help with the recovery, there are a few new tools. Corporate tax cuts announced in 2019 will go even lower, and the government promises to keep pressuring Ottawa for a so-called fair deal. In fact, Budget 2020 features an entire chapter on this fight. We share the frustration of so many Albertans um, when we've been a province who's made an absolute outsized contribution to Confederation. And then we see a federal government implement policies that are absolutely contrary to the economic interests and to the interests of Albertans, and I would suggest the interest of Canadians. That's why we've devoted a chapter to it. What isn't in this budget? Any kind of direct public investment in the energy sector. And there's nothing to account for the emerging threat of coronavirus as the threat of a worldwide pandemic begins to impact the global demand for oil. Ultimately, um, we can't predict where the coronavirus and the economic effects will end, quite frankly. But what we can do is we can manage the variables uh, that this province can manage. Ahead, why Canada won't be picking up the tab anymore for Harry and Meghan's security. This winter storm is hitting Quebec and it's forced schools and flight cancellations across the province. The whiteout is made for some dangerous driving conditions too. This semi-truck nearly slid right off a Quebec City highway. The same storm system is making travel difficult in parts of Ontario where people are being urged to avoid non-essential travel. The province is bracing for snow squalls and blizzard-like conditions into the weekend. Remember that false emergency alert about a nuclear station in Ontario earlier this year? Well, a new report by the Ontario government blames human error. The alert about the Pickering nuclear station was sent to cell phones, radios and TVs across the province on January 12th. It took 108 minutes to let people know it was a false alarm. A report from the Chief of Emergency Management Ontario blames communications failures, procedural gaps and a lack of training for the error. Canadian taxpayers will soon no longer be paying to protect the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Public Safety Minister Bill Blair confirmed today the RCMP has been obligated since November to provide security to the royal couple, who are considered internationally protected persons. Harry, Meghan and baby Archie settled into a mansion north of Victoria in BC, but at the end of March they will formally relinquish their royal privileges, and when their status changes, so will their security. Balance in the bays next, Ottawa's struggle to protect a fragile species and support workers at sea.
The future of the endangered North Atlantic right whale is still deeply uncertain. Only 400 remain, and at least 30 right whales have died in the last three years, most of them in Canadian waters. They're being struck by ships or becoming entangled in fishing gear. Now, as Ross Lord reports, the federal government has imposed strict new rules to protect the fragile population. With their critically low numbers at risk of declining even further, the future of North Atlantic right whales is largely in the hands of legislators. Federal politicians sorting out how the whales can coexist with cargo ships and fish harvesters. Our number one focus is we want to try to uh, really bring down to zero the risk to the North Atlantic whales. We are confident that these measures will be effective. The new rules include closing fishing zones for the entire season in areas where right whales gather, expanding temporary closures into the Bay of Fundy, requiring more fish harvesters to mark their gear, and reimposing speed limits on cargo ships. Whale researchers say the rules are similar to previous years. I think they've kind of refined them, so I think they're going to be a lot more pointed and perhaps try and be a bit more effective. For crab fishers whose catches might suffer during the summer, there is an opportunity to start their season early and avoid contact with the whales. The hope is that people can be in and out before the North Atlantic right whales return to Canadian waters. Researchers say 10 right whale calves have been born over the winter in the waters of the southern United States, which equals the number killed last summer in Canadian waters. They're doing their part to make sure that they're continuing the population. We need to make sure we're doing our part. A new search for symmetry on the seas. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is booked to New Brunswick. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.